Hi, my name is Lynn McTaggart. Welcome to my podcast, Living the New Science. In these first podcasts, I'm covering some extraordinary discoveries by frontier scientists and why this changes everything we think about how our world works and also how we should live our lives. Today, we're going to discuss the scientific reasons why consciousness and intention can affect matter. For nearly 20 years, I've been investigating an outlandish premise that thought affects physical reality. A sizable body of research exploring the nature of consciousness carried on for more than 30 years in prestigious scientific institutions around the world shows that thoughts are capable of affecting everything from the simplest machines to the most complex living things. This evidence suggests that human thoughts and intention are an actual physical something with the astonishing capacity to change our world. Every thought we have is a tangible energy with the power to transform. What that means is just this. A thought is not only a thing, a thought is a thing that influences other things. This central idea that consciousness affects matter, lies at the very heart of an irreconcilable difference between the worldview offered by classical physics, which is the science of the big visible world, and that of quantum physics, the science of the world's most diminutive components. That difference concerns the very nature of matter and the ways it can be influenced to change. All of classical physics and indeed the rest of science, is derived from the laws of motion and gravity developed by the 17th century physicist Isaac Newton. Newton's laws described a universe in which all objects operated according to certain fixed laws of motion. Matter was considered inviolate and self-contained with its own fixed boundaries. Influence of any sort required something physical to be done to something else, a force or collision. So making something change basically entailed heating it, burning it, freezing it, dropping it, or giving it a good swift kick. Newtonian laws, science's grand rules of the game, as the celebrated physicist Richard Feynman once referred to them, and their central premise that things exist independently of each other, underpin our own philosophical view of the world. We believe that all of life and its tumultuous activity carries on around us, regardless of what we do or think. We sleep easy in our beds at night, in the certainty that when we close our eyes, the universe doesn't disappear. Nevertheless, That tidy little view of the universe as a collection of isolated, well-behaved objects got dashed in the early part of the 20th century. Once the pioneers of quantum physics began peering closer into the heart of matter. The tiniest bits of the universe, those very things that make up the big objective world, did not in any way behave themselves according to any rules that these scientists had ever known. This outlaw behavior was encapsulated in a collection of ideas that became known as the Copenhagen Interpretation, after the place where the forceful Danish physicist Niels Bohr and his brilliant protege, the German physicist Werner Heisenberg, formulated the likely meaning of their extraordinary mathematical discoveries. Bohr and Heisenberg realized that atoms are not little solar systems of billiard balls like we're taught in physics class, but something far more messy, a tiny cloud of probability. As I discussed in podcast two, every subatomic particle is not a solid and stable thing but exists simply as a potential of any one of its future selves, or what is known by physicists as a superposition, or sum of all probabilities. 
Imagine it like a person staring at himself in a hall of mirrors. One of their conclusions concerned the notion of indeterminacy, that you can never know all there is to know about a subatomic particle all at the same time. If you discover information about where it is, for instance, you cannot work out at the same time exactly where it's going or at what speed. They spoke about a quantum particle as two things, both a particle, which is a congealed set thing, and a wave function, a big smeared out region of space and time, any corner of which the particle could occupy. It's a bit like describing a person as comprising the entire street where he lives. Their conclusion suggested that at its most elemental, physical matter isn't solid and stable, indeed isn't in anything yet. Subatomic reality did not resemble the solid and reliable state of being described to us by classical science, but a prospect of seemingly infinite options. So capricious seemed the smallest bits of nature that the first quantum physicists had to make do with a crude, symbolic approximation of the truth, a mathematical range of all possibility. So here's amazing fact number one. At the quantum level, reality resembles unset jello. The quantum theories developed by Bohr, Heisenberg, and a host of others rocked the very foundation of the Newtonian view of matter as something discrete and self-contained. They suggested that matter, at its most fundamental, could not be divided into independently existing units, and indeed couldn't even be fully described. What this means is just this. Things have no meaning in isolation, but only in a web of dynamic interrelationship. There is no such thing as a thing. There is only relationship. The quantum pioneers also discovered the astonishing ability of quantum particles to influence each other, despite the absence of all those usual things that physicists understand are responsible for influence such as an exchange of force occurring at a certain velocity. What they discovered in quantum physics is once in contact, particles retained some eerie remote hold over each other, as we also discussed in podcast two. The actions, for instance, something like the magnetic orientation of one subatomic particle, instantaneously influenced the other no matter how far they were separated. At the subatomic level, change also resulted through dynamic shifts of energy. So these little packets of vibrating energy constantly traded energy back and forth to each other, like ongoing passes in a game of basketball, a ceaseless toing and froing that gives rise to an unfathomably large basic layer of energy in the universe. And that's called the zero-point field, and we talked about it again in podcast two. Subatomic matter appeared to be involved in a continual exchange of information, causing constant refinement and subtle alteration. The universe was not a storehouse of static separate objects, but a single organism of interconnected energy fields in a constant state of becoming. At its most infinitesimal level, our world resembles a vast network of quantum information with all of its component parts constantly on the phone. Here's where it starts to get interesting. The only thing dissolving this little cloud of probability into something solid and measurable was the involvement of an observer. Once these scientists decided to take a closer look at a subatomic particle by taking a measurement, the subatomic entity that had existed as pure potential would collapse into one particular state. The implications of those early experimental findings are profound. 
living consciousness somehow was the influence that turned the possibility of something into something real. So the moment we looked at an electron or took a measurement, it appeared that we helped to determine its final state. This suggested that the most essential ingredient in creating our universe is the consciousness that observes it. Several of the central figures in quantum physics argued that the universe was democratic and participatory, a joint effort between observer and that observed. The observer effect in quantum experimentation gives rise to another heretical notion— That living consciousness is somehow central to this process of transforming the unconstructed quantum world into something resembling everyday reality. It suggests not only that the observer brings the observed into being, but also that nothing in the universe exists as an actual thing independently of our perception of it. It implies that observation the very involvement of consciousness, gets that jello to set. It implies that reality is not fixed, but fluid or mutable, and so possibly open to influence. The idea that consciousness creates and possibly even affects the physical universe also challenges our current scientific view of consciousness that mind is separate and somehow different from matter, is entirely generated by the brain, and remains locked up in the skull. Most modern workaday physicists just shrug their shoulders over this central conundrum, that big things are separate, but the tiny building blocks they are made up of are in instant and ceaseless communication with each other. For half a century, physicists have accepted, as though it makes perfect sense, that an electron behaving one way subatomically somehow transmutes into classical, that is, Newtonian, behavior once it realizes it's part of a larger whole. In the main, scientists have stopped caring about the troublesome questions posed by quantum physics and left unanswered by its earliest pioneers. Quantum theory works mathematically. It offers a highly successful recipe for dealing with the subatomic world. It's probably the most successful physics theory there has ever been. It's helped to build atomic bombs and lasers and to deconstruct the nature of the sun's radiation. So today's physicists have largely forgotten about the observer effect. They content themselves with their elegant equations and await the formulation of a unified theory of everything or the discovery of a few more dimensions beyond the ones that ordinary humans perceive, which they hope will somehow pull together all these contradictory findings into one centralized theory. More than 30 years ago, while the rest of the scientific community carried on by rote, a small band of frontier scientists at prestigious universities around the globe paused to consider the metaphysical implications of the Copenhagen interpretation and the observer effect. They thought about this. If matter was mutable and consciousness made matter a set something, it seemed likely that consciousness might also be able to nudge things in a particular direction. Their investigations boil down to a simple question. If the act of attention affected physical matter, what was the effect of intention, of deliberately attempting to make a change? In our act of participation as an observer in the quantum world, we might not only be creators, but also influencers. So is there evidence that consciousness affects matter? Absolutely. These renegade scientists began designing experiments which provided evidence that thinking certain directed thoughts could affect one's own body, inanimate objects, and virtually all manner of living things, from single-celled organisms to human beings. Two of the major figures in this tiny subgroup were former dean of engineering, the late Robert John, at the Princeton 
Anomalies Engineering Research Laboratory at Princeton University, called PEAR for short, and his colleague Brenda Dunn, who together created a sophisticated scholarly research program grounded in hard science. Over 25 years, John and Dunn led what became a massive international effort to quantify what's referred to as micropsychokinesis, which means the effect of mind on random event generators, which perform the electronic 21st century equivalent of the toss of a coin. The output of these electronic machines, which were the computerized equivalent of heads or tails, was controlled by randomly alternating frequency of positive and negative pulses. Because their activity was totally random, they produced heads or tails each roughly about 50% of the time, according to the laws of probability. So the most common configuration of the REG experiments was a computer screen randomly alternating two attractive images. Let's say they were of cowboys and Indians. Participants in the studies would be placed in front of the computers and asked to try to influence the machine to produce more of one image, more cowboys say, and then to focus on producing more images of Indians, and then to try not to influence the machine in either direction. Over the course of more than two and a half million trials, John and Dunn decisively demonstrated that human intention can influence these electronic devices in the specified direction. And these results were replicated independently by 68 investigators. Another persuasive body of research was amassed by the late William Broad, a psychologist and the research director of the Mind Science Foundation in San Antonio, Texas, and later the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology. Broad and his colleagues demonstrated that human thoughts can affect the direction in which fish swim, the movement of other animals such as gerbils, and the breakdown of cells in the laboratory. Broad also designed some of the earliest well-controlled studies of mental influence on human beings. In one group of studies, Broad demonstrated that one person could affect the autonomic nervous system, or fight-or-flight mechanisms, as we know them, of another. Electrodermal activity, also known as EDA, is a measure of skin resistance and shows an individual state of stress. So a change of EDA usually occurs if someone's stressed or made uncomfortable in some way. Broad's signature study tested the effect of being stared at, one of the simplest means of isolating the effect of remote influence on a human being. He repeatedly demonstrated that people were subconsciously aroused and their EDA's levels affected while they were unknowingly being stared at. Perhaps the most frequently studied area of remote influence concerns remote healing. At least 150 studies of variable scientific rigor have been carried out, and one of the best designed was conducted by the late Dr. Elizabeth Targ. During the height of the AIDS epidemic in the 1980s, she devised an ingenious, highly controlled pair of studies in which some 40 remote healers across America and healers of all kinds from Barbara Brennan's School of Light to Native American shaman, were shown to improve the health of terminal AIDS patients, even though the healers had never met or been in contact with their patients. So by the time these scientific revisionists were finished, they'd torn up the grand rule book and scattered it to the four winds. Their evidence showed that mind in some way appeared to be inextricably connected to matter and indeed was capable of altering it. Physical matter could be influenced, even irrevocably altered, not simply by force, but through the simple act of formulating a thought. These are just a few examples of the initial discoveries about consciousness, which occurred more than 30 years ago. 
There have been loads of more recent discoveries in frontier quantum physics and in laboratories around the globe, which offer answers to some of these questions, including some of the intention experiments that I've run and that I'll be talking about in future podcasts. These experiments provide evidence that our world is highly malleable, open to constant, subtle influence. They show that living things are constant transmitters and receivers of measurable energy. New models of consciousness portray it as an entity capable of trespassing physical boundaries of every description. And that's certainly what I've found in my intention experiments and power of eight groups. Intention appears to be something akin to a tuning fork, causing the tuning forks of other things in the universe to resonate at the same frequency. Intention has already been employed in many quarters to cure illness, alter physical processes, and influence events. But here's the important piece to take home. It's not a special gift, but a learned skill, readily taught, and certainly something I teach all the time. Indeed, we already use intention in many aspects of our daily lives. This means that our observation, our human consciousness, is central to the process through which subatomic quantum flux actually becomes something set or real. It's though our active attention is the one thing that can catch the butterfly on the wing. This suggests that the most essential ingredient of the interconnected universe is the living consciousness that observes it. And here's the most amazing fact of all. This astounding observation suggests that the consciousness of the observer brings the observed object into being, which means just this. Nothing in the universe exists as an actual thing independently of our perception of it. On the most profound level, quantum theory suggests that reality is created by each of us at the moment of attention. This implies that every minute of every day, we are creating our world. According to all of this evidence, in our active participation as an observer in the quantum world, we are also influencers. In other words, we don't just simply stop the butterfly at a certain point in its flight. We also influence the path it'll take, pushing it in a particular direction. This is not so far-fetched when you consider the latest experiments on the human mind that demonstrate that human consciousness is also a quantum process. So think of it this way. Living beings therefore are, in a sense, ordering systems, creating order where there's chaos. In the next podcast, but also on my Facebook pages and community emails, I am sharing with you some experiments you can do at home to test your own power. If you'd like to join my community and check these out, just go to my website, lynnmctaggart.com, and join the newsletter and you'll receive some information and videos about these amazing experiments that will demonstrate what a powerful intender you are. This is Lynn McTaggart, helping you to live the new science. Keep listening, and I'll continue to give you information and tips each time about how to incorporate this new information into your life. If you've enjoyed this podcast and want to hear more, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any installments. And if you're listening on iTunes or Podbean, please make sure to rate and review this podcast. Thanks so much.